preliminary work. They conducted some field work in 2013, talking to households about their experience of migration, what migration meant for them. Um, and one of the quotes um, really stood out to us uh, from, from one of the um, participants, and it was a sentiment that was echoed by lots of other families that um, our team spoke to. And it was the idea that somehow women seem to be more tied to their families, more likely to send remittances. And this, this quote is from, from one of them, and it highlights, at least in the mind of uh, this particular respondent, a, a gendered difference in remittance behaviour, suggesting that women, for, some, for reasons that we might explore, um, remit more, are more reliable at remitting to their families, whereas the, the, the sons go off. Um, and other respondents talked to us about how they saw women as the saviors of the family, always being there to support their, their families. So we wanted to see if we could try and unpick this, this finding. We wanted to see if we could see how we could substantiate it with other research and try and get a firmer picture about uh, maybe potentially different uh, remittance behaviors uh, between men and women. Um, so what I'm going to do to, to today is to talk about some of the preliminary findings from our more quantitative approach to try and unpick uh, this observation that we found from our qualitative work. The conceptual framework that is going to underpin our, our work, or the work that I'm presenting today, um, draws very strongly on the new economics of labour and migration and the discussion around potential motives for remittance. Uh, the idea that remittances might be motivated by a number of factors, which the literature broadly groups into these three uh, strands. So remittances might be purely altruistic, or they might represent some sort of relationship between the family that could be called enlightened self-interest. So, for example, a co-insurance arrangement. I'll send money home in the hope that if I need support from my family, they'll support me later. Um, or some kind of exchange motive. So people are sending money home in expectation of inheriting assets or, or you know, some kind of uh, economic or social return on their remittance behavior. Um, empirically, of course, this is quite hard to disentangle because it's very difficult with quantitative data to really establish whether people are remitting for altruism or through enlightened self-interest. It's very hard for us to imagine what this might look like um, in a kind of quantitative way. Um, and the evidence is broadly suggestive that exchange or co-insurance kind of mechanisms dominate altruism. But of course, because this is a very difficult phenomenon to really understand, the, liter the, the evidence on this should be regarded as a little bit um, uh, uh, suggestive rather than conclusive. One particular feature, though, that we've, we recognize in the, in the empirical literature is a gap around gender. Um, so either data doesn't exist on what women are remitting because women don't always feature in surveys of migrants, um, or um, data isn't reported um, broken down by gender. So it's difficult to see women's behavior compared to men's. There is some work on this, though. Um, so, for example, a World Bank study uh, led by Orozco and various other authors reviewed data for 18 low- and middle-income countries, um, and they concluded that women remit less than um, uh, men migrants. Um, a decomposition of the remittance gap in Vietnam uh, conducted by um, Nimi and Riley suggests that actually women do remit less. And both of these studies suggest that women remit less because they have weaker economic opportunities at the destination. They earn less, therefore they remit less. Maybe the type of contracts they have also mean that they, they remit less because their, their earnings are retained by recruitment agencies or other such institutions. Um, of, uh, in contrast, though, a study by Abrego looking at Salvadorian migrants in the US has suggested that actually their families back home are better off if their migrant member is a woman because the, the, the mother is more likely to be sending money home than the father. So the evidence is a little bit mixed, and that's what, something we want to look at for the African context. 
Um, and then we also want to explore something about the motives. Um, can we see any evidence in our data that maybe motives differ? And can we or should we be ascribing this to different levels of altruism or is there something else going to go uh, 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 happening in this? Um, so as an overview of the rest of my talk, I'm going to first of all spend a few minutes on data, on remittances, and talking to you about uh, what this data gap is, under reporting, for example. I'm then going to introduce you very briefly to the surveys that we've been conducting, and the, and the Zimbabwe survey in particular. I'm then going to talk through um, uh, how we model uh, remittance decisions, uh, talk you through uh, a little bit on the technical aspect of our research, um, and then move on to the results and, and discussion. I've, I've kept this as quite a broad, hopefully accessible talk, so I'm not going to be presenting lots and tables of regression output, because I, I know this conference is trying to make our, our research more accessible to uh, not just an economics audience. Um, the one uh, takeaway, I think, from this paper um, is, is that women, what we find is that although women, when we, when we just look at the raw data, it suggests that women do send less remittances home compared to men migrants. Once you control for characteristics of age, education, those kinds of characteristics, women are just as likely as men to be sending remittances home and to send the same amount. So we observe no difference in what women uh, are sending home. What we do observe as a difference is how they choose to send their remittances home, either in the form of cash or in-kind, so goods uh, that can be sent home, like food and clothing. So that's the sort of takeaway, and now I'll try and flesh that out. So first of all, on the data gap, um, there's a number of elements to the data gap on remittances generally. We all, we're all familiar with, uh, we can understand very easily why estimates of cash remittances might be severely underreported, um, because we're all familiar with the ways that people send money home to avoid uh, paying official transaction costs and charges. Uh, money is carried home by a number of ways. Um, and, and even cash transactions or financial transactions don't necessarily involve the direct transfer of cash across a border, but can involve sophisticated arrangements where um, networks of people are involved paying bills for each other or transferring money on other people's behalf. Um, a lot of this data is not reported by gender, so certainly the international remittances data, you, you won't see that broken down by gender. Um, but the other aspect of the data gap is the data on in-kind remittances. So these are goods and uh, things like food, clothing, medicine, education supplies, those sorts of things that we also think are either not collected and when they are, they're underreported. Um, so, although there are some surveys, which I'll show you about, that do collect this kind of data, they don't often uh, report what the in-kind remittances are. So, we've done some uh, work on these surveys. But they also don't always capture the most common types of things that people are sending home, and I'll elaborate on that in a few moments. So, what one takeaway on this data gap uh, f for, for us is that we think that remittances might be underestimated by as much as uh, between 10 and as much as 50% by not including in-kind remittances. Um, and the underreporting is particularly significant for women migrants. So let's look at some, some of the data on, on remittances uh, that includes in-kind remittances. This is data for two Pacific islands. And I'll speed up a bit, I think. Um, and this, this data for Fiji and Tonga suggests that in-kind remittances are about 25% of total remittances. So there's some under-reporting if we ignore the in-kind. Um, and then when we look at the African migration surveys, the World Bank African migration surveys, we can see again that remittances by women are much more likely to be in-kind, so goods, um, and these are significantly under-reported. And you can see by the height of the orange bar on the far right that the under-reporting is more significant for, for women than it might be for men. Um, this is the case of Ken Kenya and Burkina Faso. Um, and we can see that the in-kind remittances make up the gap 
once we, once we include them in our estimate of total. These are our, our own calculations from the uh, migration surveys. A slightly different scenario uh, in Senegal and also in Nigeria, where the in-kind remittances don't make up the gap, but we can still see there's significant under-reporting of remittances if we, if we leave out in-kind remittances. And then finally, the South Africa survey, which unfortunately doesn't report values um, and only shows what people are sending home rather than what the value of that is. Um, but we can still see some evidence that women seem to exhibit some preference for sending uh, goods home rather than cash. So let me um, move on to our research and what we're doing. So very briefly, we've been collecting data in five countries in different uh, regions of the world. Um, we have a common approach to sampling and a common framework for key definitions. Um, and in the interest of time, I will skip this now, and I'll just say if you want to find out more about our data, including if you want to use our data, it's all available at this web link, which will be on these slides when you, um, if you want to download the data at some point in the future. We'd be very, would be very happy for people to use our, our data. The Zimbabwe survey took place in 2015, around Easter time that year. Um, we have uh, data on around 1,200 households from three different districts of the country. Um, this comprises 18 villages. So we, we suggest that our data is representative of rural households in these, three, in these three districts, but not nationally representative because our districts weren't chosen randomly. Um, so therefore, we don't claim national uh, representation. Um, we have from our households almost 1,500 migrants amongst that. So our households are reporting on their migrants. Uh, so obviously there's issues around recall and uh, information gaps between the migrant and the, and the household, but we have data on nearly 1,500 people. Uh, very briefly on our sample size, so just a, a, a two points to make on this. Um, this table shows the number of households that fit into different categories of having migrants or not having migrants and shown for the three districts separately. So roughly 70% of our households have a migrant or at least one migrant. That percentage is slightly lower in Gwanda, so very close to the South African border, because at the time we were doing our field work, South Africa was beginning a lot of uh, repatriation of, of Zimbabwean migrants. Um, so so our, our field workers reported that households were very reluctant to tell us about their migrants because they were uh, nervous that there may be repercussions uh, for their migrants if, we, if they gave us too much information. So the percentage of households with migrants uh, is, is, a bit, is a bit lower. Um, but generally you can see that the two regions closer to South Africa have more international migrants um, than, than Hurungwe in the north, which has fewer uh, international ones. So let me return to remittances, in-kind remittances. So the World Bank survey define in-kind remittances using that list on the left-hand side of the screen. I've grouped them into broadly household appliances, business equipment, these sorts of things, although that's, that's my grouping. Obviously, we could argue whether a sewing machine is a personal or a household or a business, but you can see these are quite large items that have significant economic value to them, um, but it doesn't include food or clothing. Um, in another World Bank report, looking at um, uh, remittances from the Netherlands back to Suriname, they suggest that most of the parcels that are being sent home contain food or clothing and the sort of larger items are much lower in frequency. So the African Migration Service are very, very useful resources. They are still under-reporting on in-kind remittances if it's food and clothing that people are sending home more often. So when we designed our survey, we decided to focus on food and clothing and these smaller items, um, resources for school, medicines, these sorts of things. And we can see that the bulk of in-kind remittances that people are sending home are indeed food and clothing. Um, so these are the remittances that are sent home in the last 12 months. 
um, the cash value is reported by the household who's responding about uh, the receipt of these remittances. And clearly there may be an issue about how you value in relative terms goods that might be purchased in South Africa compared to what their value is in Zimbabwe. Um, that's something we're still looking at. But we can see that food and clothing are the most significant items being sent home. We can also see, um, using our data, that those in-kind remittances are proportionately much more significant for women. So again, there's an under-reporting if we only looked at cash. And we can see that um, if we look at the final uh, graph on the right-hand side, that although the value of the in-kind remittances doesn't make up the gap completely, um, it goes uh, a substantial way to making up that gap. So it, on average, it looks like women are sending less home. Um, but of course, our women migrants are not the same as our men migrants. They differ in a number of ways. Um, they're younger. Um, they're more likely to be international. More of our women migrants are in South Africa than uh, staying within the country. Um, so in a way, you would think that maybe they'd be more likely to send remittances home by cash because they're having to send them across, uh, across a border. But no, they're still sending them uh, uh, home um, in, in, in goods. Let me move on to our empirical approach. So we're using uh, three different, we're estimating three different econometric models here. Um, one on the incidence, so just a very simple probability model of does a migrant send remittances home? We then um, model the amount, so the combined dollar value of cash and in-kind remittances. And then we look at the mix of remittances, so, so the percentage of total that is, is cash. Um, I've put an equation up there, um, which just uh, puts that in mathematical terms for those of us who, who like to see an equation to understand a, a model. So we use gender, we use a range of other characteristics of the migrant and of the household that they've come from. We cluster our observations at the household level because of that unobserved heterogeneity, or, uh, heterogeneity across households and shared uh, um, characteristics within households of different members. We also make a first attempt at uh, um, tackling the selection bias that might occur in models two and three where we're looking at amounts and the mix, because obviously this data is only available for people who are actually sending money home or goods home. Um, so we use a Tobit model as our first attempt to, um, to, to deal with selection bias issues. I'm not going to put any tables of regression results up. The paper is linked already online, so you're very welcome to read it in more detail. I thought I'd try and present the results in a slightly more accessible way, um, so not trying to put too many numbers on a screen. Um, so these are, this is what we observe from estimating that full, the full model that I just showed you as an equation. So I've got all of the characteristics of the migrant their household uh, included. So when we control for all of these characteristics, we find that there's no difference in the probability of sending remittances home between men and women, no differences in the amount that they're sending home, but a statistically significant and not a, not a particularly small difference in, in terms of magnitude um, in the mix. So we observe that after we control for characteristics that we think might, might relate to earning potential at the destination, we find that women are just as likely to send money home, remittances home, uh, to send similar amounts in value, but they are 12.5% percentage points less um, likely. Sorry, the, the percentage of cash that they sent home is 12.5 percentage points lower than it is for men. Um, so that's, that's quite a significant difference. So this suggests then that this idea that women remit less than men needs to be looked at, not just for Zimbabwe, but for, for other countries as well. And um, we may be underestimating the, the value of remittances that are flowing between countries or between migrants and their households. I want to return to some of the ideas that I talked earlier about, about motives for remittances. I've got five minutes left. So... I've summarized here some of the um, results we've got from our econometric work. 
Um, and I've, I've just pulled out some of the sort of themes that have emerged from that work. Let me first of all talk to, about the exchange um, a hypothesis idea that I mentioned earlier. So this is the idea that migrants are sending remittances home in exchange for something that they're going to receive back from the family. So it might be inheritance, um, it may be a part of a contractual arrangement about looking after children, for example. And there's some, there's some evidence that men are more likely to be following these exchange motives than women. So there's a number of points I can, I can uh, direct you to. So for example, if we look at our results on household wealth, so these are, these are fixed tangible assets that we have data on, we find that there is a positive correlation between um, how much men are sending home and the value of these assets that, that their households have, um, but we find no link for women. Um, another uh, possible evidence for exchange is if we look at remittance decay. So if we look at the time away that the migrant has uh, been from the household, um, we see that the longer the migrant has been away, the less likely they are to send money home, and also the smaller the amount. But this only applies to men. There's no change over time, over that time profile for women. Um, another possible exchange um, or evidence for exchange might come in our results on dependent children. So we find that um, if men have dependent children left behind in the household, they, are, they send more remittances home, whereas it doesn't seem to affect the amount of remittances that women are sending home. So there seems to be some evidence for exchange motives for our male migrants, but we don't seem to find any strong exchange, uh, evidence for exchange for our, our women migrants. So that might lead us to think, well, maybe women are just so altruistic that uh, they send money home regardless. I think that would be a, a jumping the gun a little bit. Um, I think we would, we would find it hard to think that uh, women are more altruistic. Why should women be more altruistic than men? So we'd like to suggest uh, some alternative um, uh, interpretations of our results. So while we do find some evidence of exchange for men, we can't necessarily include that the absence of that evidence means altruism is the dominant motive for, for female remittances. And we think it's important to look at the context that remittances are taking place in. So we, this is what we plan to do in our, in our follow-up work, is to try and understand institutions that might influence whether or not people send remittances home and might also influence what they send home, whether it's goods or, or cash. So for example, um, in the Zimbabwean context, traditional inheritance practices favor men and sons and older sons compared to younger sons, and also sons of uh, uh, higher order, higher status wives than lower status wives. So men may have a stronger incentive to send cash because that's going to be invested, hopefully, um, in the household assets, in the household business, which will be inherited in part, at least, by, uh, by the man. Um, there may also be an element of control. It, there may be uh, gendered, um, gendered relationships within the household, which mean that male migrants have more control over what their remittances are used for, and that might not apply to such an extent to women. This might also um, reflect some differences in ethnicity and practices of inheritance that exist between different ethnic groups within our sample, um, which we're researching at the moment. Uh, this element of control might also reflect um, uh, a preference for women uh, to send things home in kind, so actual goods that have a specific purpose and a specific purpose by a specific person in the family. So if you send baby clothes home, the only person that can use them, unless they're sold, are the, is the baby in the household. Similarly, food or um, education supplies, those sorts of things are going to be consumed within the household. So there may be a control issue, and that's why women are preferring to send uh, food and clothing. Um, so we plan to try and unpack the household and look at uh, relationships between migrants and other members in the family. 
The results might also reflect income sharing practices. Um, there's a lot of literature that looks at um, the way incomes are, are not necessarily fully pooled within rural communities, but certainly shared to a certain extent, and a lot of pressure on families to um, contribute towards uh, community level activities. I'm going to uh, move on to just one last slide, if I may, um, uh, on generational norms as well. So we, we observe in our data that older migrants are more likely to be sending money home, and we think this, rec this um, uh, supports some of the uh, observations we made in the field uh, four years ago. Um, talking to older people, they seemed to have a stronger sense of responsibility towards their families, talking about sending money home, whereas younger people seem to see their life, their future, outside of Zimbabwe. So they had less incentive to send money home. I'll wrap now, um, just with a couple of conclusions to take away, uh, which I won't repeat them all. I'll move on to the last one about imp policy implications. So why does this matter? So one is that Clearly, if we ignore in-kind remittances, we're ignoring the contribution or part of the contribution that women make to rural economies and to household economies in, in rural areas. It raises questions about what might happen to remittance flows if, say, transaction charges come down. They are notoriously high in, in, in Africa. Will that change what people send home? if the reason they're not sending cash is not because of transaction charges, but because of other issues around institutions like inheritance, marriage, income pooling, um, may have similar uh, implications for who might contribute to a diaspora bond if, say, uh, the projects that are funded by a diaspora bond don't necessarily concur with the uh, priorities of the migrants. That's all. Thank you very much.